All right, it's time now to welcome our Rams writer at The Athletic, Jordan Roderick. Jordan, the whole point of these conversations is kind of kind of follow the path that these teams have taken to this point. And with the Rams, I want to start about a year ago, right? So January 30th, I remember I was at home. I was about to leave for the Super Bowl. I was watching a movie with my then-girlfriend, now fiancé, and the news came down that the Rams had traded for Matthew Stafford. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, I guess this makes sense. Like, this all happened very fast. Yeah, imagine what I was thinking. Uh, oh, I can't even. <laughs> I mean, it's from the Jared Goff is our quarterback right now press conference moment to that is a matter of days. Mm -hmm. You know, it really wasn't that long. Take me through your reaction to that, what you thought of it in the moment, how you felt it fit into what that team needed at the moment and why it was just part of their DNA as who in just who they are right now. Yeah, it, I kind of knew it was coming. You still didn't really believe it because that Friday night was actually my birthday the night before. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll put off the glass of wine for the next night. And it stayed on my counter for the next five days. <laughs> um, so I was making some calls just because I had, had been hearing some things. And I was like, really? Is that? Are they really going to pivot like this? As all this stuff is happening in Cabo. Yeah, as all <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is happening in Cabo. And you're, and you're getting like weird, you're, you know, hey, look. Do you know who I just saw? Kind of text yeah. and all this stuff. So I start making some calls, and I learned that they, the Rams, are making calls with teams about Jared, and not just gauging, you know, would you be willing to trade in general, but also, would you take this guy? Kind yeah. of a thing. And and you know, not to sound mean to Jared, but it just was one of those things where you're like, they're they're serious. You know, you you, you because of the contract, it almost was like that that almost like a subconscious block or a bias in your mind that you're you're thinking no but they can't right because that's but, how you think about but, everything with this but team the now. rams but yeah that's the thing this this team has retrained my brain seriously yeah, it has it, to it has to and and then so i'm sitting there i'm like oh they're taking call and then and then i at the end of the night i get after the piece is filed and it's out and um you know people are like you know quoting it and saying uh this is not going to happen this piece is is being manufactured to help manufacture a trade market. And I was like, no, because people, they're, they're calling people. <laughs> and, and then the next day, 8.30 p.m. Pacific, um, it happens. And it Brad, Brad Holmes yeah. must still be in Pacific time at that point because he had just joined <laughs> the Lions for, from the Rams. And you're, you're thinking to yourself, okay, Matthew Stafford, what do I know about Matthew Stafford? And you, you just have these images in your head of um, taking hits and, and playing through stuff. And then also what I thought of initially was the arm angles and the, the, the leverage points and the way that he has uh, for years and years looked off safeties and done different things um, to maneuver defenses and, and especially to do so post-snap. And after covering this team, and you and I have talked about this at length, about what they brought into their house essentially in terms of that defense and understanding that this was going to be the wave, the, the post-snap rotations, defenses that can make things really, really muddy on the back end and make quarterbacks process and, and pressure in different ways that, that Jared just was not handling at that time. Yeah. And teams had figured out Sean's offense, and, and I say that bluntly, it had become something that was solvable, especially was with the quarterback. The box was too small. Yes, yeah, especially with the quarterback. And I know you, you and Nate, especially, have talked about you know how this offense has evolved. So with Stafford, this was what they were hoping for. In fact, you know, in October, Sean told me, you know, I knew he was going to be good, didn't know he was going to be this good. So they needed to go from you know a guy whose ceiling they knew, and then also felt that he would never again reach that ceiling. But then they needed to pass that ceiling. They needed to get past, um, not necessarily statistically, but in terms of the evolution of the offense. They needed to get past what that entire package of that 2018 season was. They needed to do it in a different way. And to do that, they needed a different quarterback who can do the things that uh, has the variables that, that I mentioned before. And also who has seen a lot of football who can help build this. Totally. And it's you publicly and privately that summer after they made the deal. Sean McVay was a true believer. Like, he was a true believer in what this could do for them. And the, the terms that he would talk about it in, he would say that plainly, just like, I believe in this. And it was almost an experiment. You know, when you take a quarterback that has been in the league for a decade and he's been in a similar set of circumstances, right? I mean, it ebbs and flows in Detroit, but there is one structure and that's all we knew him in and you drop him into a different set of circumstances, what does it look like? And that's always the eternal question with quarterbacks. How much is them and how much is what is around them? And it was amazing to watch 
it work out exactly how they wanted it to work out. Like it literally was the plan to a T where you said, we need a quarterback that makes our quarter makes our play caller not have to be right all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. We need a problem solver and flexibility and margin of error and we need the offense to expand. That box that we talked about needs to be a lot bigger. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what happens. Yeah, and, and you know what too, and I love that you said that because it's it, it comes down to this with this team. We're gonna probably talk much more about this as this continues, but it comes down to this team almost having um, a fixation on introducing catalysts into their system yeah. because they see it force growth. They see it force change. A lot of times, especially with the culture they've built and the core of players that they have on their roster, it has been changed for the positive. So they felt that Matthew Stafford also embodied some of those characteristics. You watch uh, the majority of his games, he seems to embody those uh, characteristics. I kind of have been starting calling him darkly chaotic Matthew Stafford yeah. this year. <laughs> he is very darkly chaotic. He's very like, it's almost like um, nihilistic at times. You sit there and you're like, Matthew, are you okay? Because he, he likes to be in, he thrives in, I don't know if he likes all it. All trick shots all the time. That's the joke it. that we make. But he likes to, he, he, I don't know, again, I don't know if he likes it, but he, he finds a new part of his brain there. Yeah. And that's, I think, some of the things that the Rams saw, certainly when they're in Cabo, Sean McVay's picking up on that as someone who is very good at connecting with people and figuring out sort of their why and what makes them tick. And, and I do believe that once they figured out, first of all, this is the realistic guy that they can trade for at this time. Um, they did their due diligence on other quarterbacks, but this is the guy who is realistic. And then once you get to know him and start talking to him more, you sort of see that part of his brain that you're like, okay, this actually fits our build. This fits our building. This fits what we do environmentally in this ecosystem. And when put in place in this ecosystem, we believe that this can he can become a part of this, be a catalyst that pushes this forward. And I want let's talk about just the overall narrative surrounding this all in mentality and the way that they spend their draft capital. Because obviously there are high profile examples. You trade two first round picks for Jalen Ramsey. You trade two first round picks for Matthew Stafford. We forget about the Brandon Cooks trade. <laughs> like it's, just, it's so far in the past that it's not even a part of this anymore. But that's how they've handled their first round picks. And we know that. But if you look at the way this roster is constructed, three guys that I think have been crucial to this season and then especially in the playoffs have had big moments. Guys that are on the other side of this coin. People like Ernest Jones. People like Nick Scott. People like Greg Gaines. There are these, pe- these people that just kind of <laughs> cycle in and out that you don't think about enough. Brian Allen's another really good example, mm-hmm. right? Just these guys who are third, fourth, fifth round picks. You know, Jordan Fuller's hurt now, but he was one of those guys. Cooper the, Cup. The Cooper Cup. Ex- <laughs> the connective tissue of their roster is it plays in combination with these big mm-hmm. swings that they have. And those guys cycle in and out, right? It's a different version of that group every single year, but it's one of the reasons that they've been able to kind of sustain this success. Mm-hmm. It's um, my, my sister's a biologist, and a while ago when I was starting to cover this team and learning about what these were, she kind of gave me some tutoring sessions, right? Because <laughs> in sports for 10 years, you forget everything else in life that you've ever learned. Nothing else matters. Yeah, nothing yeah. else matters. Um, except for, ironically, statistics, um, which I failed in college. <laughs> so <laughs> it all comes full circle. But she talked to me about this term mutualism, where both parties need each other to exist, but uh, they mutually benefit from the yeah. interaction. And this Symbiotic relationship. Well, I mean, yeah. close, but yeah. definitely mutu- mutualistic is a, a, a level above where they collapse without each other. Yeah. This is absolutely what this is. This build, so you talk to people in the building and they hate calling it all in. They, they think it's lazy. They think that it's so um, just it's kind of shallow way to describe what this actually is because of what they've built and the planning that's gone into it. And almost um, taking a cutting from that 2017, 2018 build that happened so fast, taking a cutting from that and then replanting it and then hyper fertilizing it, right? And, and turning it into like warp speed of, uh, you know, compounding all of these things of, of what it was. And these guys, their, their moves, their big moves, their high profile moves that everybody is talking about right now, they actually don't work without the undercurrent, like you said, of these other guys who they draft and forced to play, again, catalyst, forced to play at a very young age early on their rookie deal so you can financially make the bigger contracts work, but also so you can um, complement some of the core players on the roster who you use draft capital to bring in. Neither one works without each other. You can't field a team fully of, of you know, you could try. Uh, third, well, fourth, they've fifth, tried sixth. with all the dead money that they've endured over the last few years. Sure, but like this, you know, fully, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth round, seventh round undrafted free agents, um, 
you know, you're not going to see rosters fully built with that. But the way that they've done it fiscally and then also physically and schematically is they've built layers into their scheme that exist with complementary traits. So that narrows their focus in the scouting department. And they've also like made their scouting Give me an process. example of that. Somebody so, that really like hones in on well, that Well, Greg idea. Gaines. I love okay. talking about Greg Gaines. Greg Gaines, man. I love it. He's like a wheel of cheese rolling down a hill and you love it. So Greg Gaines, so they're looking for someone. Um, they, they let Aaron Donald be creative up front with what they do. Yes. And obviously they play gap and a half. So when you are looking for a guy who can complement uh, what Aaron Donald does, you're not looking for another Aaron Donald. You don't have a first round pick to get Aaron Donald, first of all. You don't have multiple first round picks to find another Aaron Donald because you've traded them away. And so now you have to draft and develop a guy not who is going to be lined up next to Aaron Donald and be even like a version of him. You're going to need a guy who has very specific traits that complement everything that Aaron does and weaknesses that Aaron Donald can hide. So you don't need someone who is a pass rush like expert, savant, miraculous player like Aaron Donald. You don't need someone who is versatile like Aaron Donald. You know that Aaron's going to be creative in whatever scheme they run, and, and they're going to let him do that. And you need someone who is um, hyper-disciplined and incredibly sort of... Um, uh, can, can spatially see where all of the, the gaps in creative spaces go and where they line up. And that's how they found Greg Gaines. They liked that he played really, really disciplined, um, even in out-of-structure situations when he was at Washington. Um, they liked it, that he sort of has that, like, um, very stout figure, right? The, yeah. the low man wins kind of situation. And they also liked that he had explosiveness. The longer he is playing through a snap, the more explosiveness he is able to gather. Those kinds of things are really important when Aaron Donald is doing what he does all around you and sort of working It's a foundational angles. thing, right? Yeah. It's something you can rely on. It's a rock when Aaron Donald kind of spins around it, which is really important. Yeah, but the, the thing was is Greg Gaines is a fourth round pick and they didn't need him. You Once you're past, you know, middle first round, early second round, guys are flawed, right? And that's just yeah. a fact. And so what they're looking for instead is they're, they're throwing out all of the traits that they know they don't need. And, and this really, um, Les Snead tried to communicate this earlier, but it really was a partnership when he and Sean found each other um, in terms of that communication of don't want versus specific, I want this player, I like what he does. Um, that often happens in these, in these rooms between coaches and staff. Instead, it's removing traits, removing things that we don't need because we have this guy and here's how he compliments. And we can play him earlier because the things Aaron Donald does so well, um, we're not asking that guy to do the same thing. We're asking Aaron to do 10 things well. We're asking Greg Gaines to do two things well. And between that, you have a hell of a defensive line. And then, you know, that works in a ripple effect. Everybody else, Jalen Ramsey, same thing. You ask Jalen Ramsey to do so many things well, and other guys only have to do one or two things well. You're only looking for one or two, you know, corners who can tackle this year, up for debate, right? But, you know, <laughs> it's you're a like, small group. You're, it's, 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 yeah, you're, you're yeah. looking for, for a lot of different things because, again, they're being creative with Jalen Ramsey. They're doing different things in that regard. So you're, you're picking fourth, fifth, sixth round corners or undrafted free agents. You're only asking him to be able to do one or two things well while Jalen does, you know, 15, 16 things well. And in that way, they've sort of overhauled not just the way that they build, but how they support the build um, with that undercurrent of players um, selected in that way by like maximizing how they are efficient in their selection and, and removing um, not just biases, I've written a lot about this year, how they remove biases from their scouting process, but also removing traits that they know are extra. And so in that way, everything becomes very efficient.